now uh, only one of our um, speakers. So, Saki, uh, and correct my pronunciation of your name, sorry for that. Uh, you're the only one who really wants to, uh, to talk with us. So from having three people uh, in the panel, we'll have like individual meeting with you. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I will introduce uh, myself uh, shortly. Uh, my name is Alexandra Goldis. Um, I'm working in EIT Climate Kick. Uh, that is the European Commission uh, institution dealing with climate issues. So on a daily basis, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm doing uh, practical work with uh, regional governments and local governments in Europe. Uh, and I was super excited when I read uh, all three uh, um, uh, short descriptions of the, speak the speeches because that was exact exactly what we as a practical organization are trying to do, so to find a better way of conducting policies uh, and introduce cooperativism in our uh, political plate, which is super hard to do. And I really uh, was excited when I read uh, that Saki was somehow uh, critically looking at this connection between cooperativism and commons and the nature. Uh, so if you are ready, we can start with you and I will make some notes and then there will be space for all of us to ask you questions. And I hope that uh, Eduardo Acosta from Colombia who will join uh, later on. So the floor is yours. Um, can you hear me well? Great. Um... Okay, so today, um, today I'm going to be talking about commoning, energy production, and the protection of nature broadly. Um, when speaking of the urban commons, I think I, so I encountered the notion of the commons through David Harvey's work on rebel cities, um, and it was on the notion of urban commons. Um, but speaking about commons more broadly, um, he posits the definition that we don't think about commons as a thing or an asset um, that's simply governable or democratically divided or epistemologically accessible, but rather that it is a social relation which is malleable between groups and the environment, that the commons is a constantly renegotiated category. Um, and this relation is crucial to their lives and livelihood, the groups. Um, I think instances of the historical cooperative movements, especially for energy purposes, so here I'm talking about um, predominantly electrification cooperatives, um, coming together in moments of crises have also identified a similar point of critique as Harvey, I would say, that certain groups don't have access or regular access to material securities that not only determine their everyday experience of their life, um, which, which is that well, food, shelter, protection from violence, healthcare, et cetera, but also uh, material security fundamentally determines whether certain people will live or die. Um, so a very, a very sort of radical, politically potent definition of what material securities are and what they do. I think my, my interest is how they interact with in ecological crises um, and how this can be a politically potent area of research which is to ask how environmental and ecological crises affect people's lives in different parts of the world. Um, and the more potent question perhaps might just be how, how does popularly produced conception of environmental injustice or crisis itself write the problem for us? How does it define the meanings? How does it presuppose what protecting people and this object that we call the environment might actually be? Um, and this critique both of Harvey um, and also the more uh, historically uh, historical instances um, are directed towards the private property regime and its necessity to produce inequalities and then further reproduce from this inequalities. Um, so I think entering the discussion from energy production, I ask what potential does a conversation of energy really have for a discussion of cooperativism and um, commoning? And I would argue that energy is not just um, thinking about, well, electrification, but a larger, um, it ranges from issues like no access 
to electricity, no access to power, but also trans transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, so I would I argue in this um, in this discussion and and the paper coming out of this discussion would be that by considering the questions of scale and looking beyond this consumption production relation um, as it's popularly um, conceptualized in terms of energy, that there's the consumption of energy um, in, the, in, in how people use it. Um, and then there's the actual production of energy. So centers where um, it's actually sort of produced from various um, natural resources. Um, I would say, well, thinking beyond this a little bit, we might actually um, we might actually be able to think about what large scale energy infrastructures and transformations might look like for the problems of climate change. Um, so for this, I start with um, well, I started initially with just thinking about rural electrification in India, um, which 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 has a really really long history, but the case I've chosen is of an independent cooperative in, in a village in Gujarat, um, which from the help from an Institute of Water Management and based in Sri Lanka, um, so capital provided by them, started their own solar powered um, energy cooperative. Um, so using this electricity, they used it for agriculture and to sell um, the surplus to a local power grid. Um, and this all happened between 2014 and 2016. Um, similarly, there, there's also a pretty, uh, there's an interesting um, report published by the International Labor Organiz Organization about similar energy cooperatives um, published in 2013, which outlines just the effectiveness of these kind of organizations in managing um, what, what we call renewable sources. So citing figures from countries like Bolivia, Philippines, Brazil, et cetera, um, it cites that up to 10% of national energy production is actually provided by the, these sort of um, cooperatives. Um, which is to say that there's actually a large history of democratically, or at least attempting to democratically manage um, the production of energy in especially rural settings around the world. And I think um, with the more historical cases, and also with a more theoretical um, engagement with this topic. Um, I, I think about specifically two dimensions of what this problem might bring forward. One is the question of scale and the other is the, is the transition to renewable energy sources. So to what extent is it possible to extend um, this imagination of common management, democratic governance, et cetera, to a problem of large infrastructure, problems that might demand large scale solutions. So I think in the rest, yeah, so in this presentation, I'm just going to um, talk briefly about scale and then talk briefly about renewables. So I think thinking about scale, cooperation and other forms of common resource management are possible in settings like rural India where the energy needs and supply um, demand a lot for two things. One is sufficient production and the other um, is actually surplus, which is then sold back. Um, therefore, capital can be reintroduced at a regular basis, um, which, is, which is to say that the actual material condition of the people, especially in this village um, in, in Dundi in Gujarat has been significantly changed. But my question here is how we confront the problem on a larger scale, where the large scale means two things. One, where the energy of problem, where the problem of energy is not delimited to the realm of the environment, but it's also an economic question. And the second is that the large scale is not simply about producing sufficient power and a small surplus, but actually about supplying energy for large scale agricultural and industrial levels. So really thinking on, on larger state and national levels, especially in the context of India. Um, I think another question that the notion of scale brings us to, which, and I think this is really being richly um, discussed in the Bolivian context, although I don't have um, actual ethnographic firsthand um, experience of this, looking at a lot of the scholarship um, at the moment, which is thinking about decentralization, not as an inherently positive, um, not as an inherently positive development, that in fact, autonomy, decentralization do not always end up um, 
to inherently better the conditions of people um, and, and the environment. So, and I think uh, in rebel cities, Harvey also has a really, has an interesting take where autonomy usually, where he looks at the calls for autonomy to be calls from entrenched elites, especially in Bolivia, elite farmers for greater control of local distribution networks. Um, so I think the question of scale also makes us consider whether small scale or decentralized autonomies, especially for energy infrastructures, I mean, what are the implications for local control for existing systems of power? Um, and at what point do we start encountering hierarchies, whether it's the limit of capital, whether it's lack of technical expertise, et cetera. So here I would introduce, I, or rather I would bring in the argument that especially with the questions of energy we, um, and democratic governance, we incorporate the state into thinking. And this is something I'll later come back to. Um, and the second thing, as I um, pointed at the beginning, which is the transition to renewable, that in a lot of the in a lot of discussions of managing the common good, I I would say that treating energy source is considered as a natural starting point. Um, treating so therefore treating the process of the sort of common good, this renewable energy as a common good has certain historical and conceptual presuppositions. One, that renewable, what we actually mean by renewable. And the second is that the renewable product is not really a product of processes, but rather as a starting point. What do I mean by this? What, what I mean is that I think in a renewable energy sources cannot, in my opinion, be taken as starting points that can simply be governed or managed. Um, it is not an object that gives itself to simply to, to just thinking about democratic governance. Rather, we have to think we have to think about it as a product that it comes together with raw process materials. In the case of solar panels, that's silica, plexiglass, glass, etc., which require which require assembling further processing. Therefore, it's not it doesn't give itself simply as an object, but rather a set of relations that actually have a long complicated history of how it got there. Um, and I think for here, my thinking is significantly um, influenced by the works of uh, Sandra Mazzadra, Brett Nielsen, their vocabulary, when they discuss the operations of capital, they point towards extraction and logistics. Um, and I think extraction and logistics precede the imagination of renewable energy. Um, that these networks are invisible yet ever present forces in contemporary capitalism. Um, and apart from production of solar panels itself, we run into questions of storing this energy in battery, which predominantly use lithium, et cetera. So this is, this is sort of a really tricky system of identifying which forms of extraction might be appropriate or acceptable in these new regimes of renewable energy um, that, are, that are managed commonly. Um, and in another project of attempting to bring out the invisible supply networks, um, I think there's a, an interesting um, project to trace uh, the Amazon Echo, the little thing that uh, people have in their homes that they talk to, etc., cetera, um, by Kate Crawford, Vlad Anjoler, um, who trace it from their production all the way to its death as waste. Um, who point out that there are entire supply chains that are nestled within supply chains, which make pointing to the origins of certain raw materials almost impossible because these materials are actually transformed so that they're unrecognizable. Um, so therefore, in a smaller context, the protection of nature is more material, tangible, immediate, um, as we might think in the rural electrification projects, but I, through this discussion, I'm trying to consider the more complicated, also messy networks of extraction and logistics that I, I think problematize this imagination, um, especially for, for rural electrification, addressing environmental injustices um, that come together to form what we call the, to what we call the uh, climate crisis. Um, and to, to end as ending um, comments, I think, no matter how par paralyzing these larger networks might be. Um, again, coming to 
certain imaginations. Um, one, a geographer, James uh, Angel, working on this, also David Harvey, of what the role of the state is in identif in sort of um, forming a resistance to um, for energy for for demanding new energy regimes, which is that that in fact we need to start theorizing what larger scaled political spaces might be to actually rethink rather rather than only localized spaces. This is not to say that it 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 has to be a direct move away from. I think it's it's. Um, this is to start thinking about what other things are possible on a larger scale for, for exactly existing infrastructures of energy. Um, and to quote Harvey, um, the point therefore is to find creative ways to use the powers of collective labor for the common good and to keep value produced under the control of laborers who produced it. And this requires a double pronged political attack, end quote. And the double pronged political attack, I would say the first is, Politi political spaces which demand from the state certain um, energy resources. And second, and this is where I think the theorization um, of commoning that really helps um, our, like this discussion is what is the use, what is the appropriate use of all these goods? How, how can they be democratically managed and, dist and distributed? Um, and I think recognizing the political nature of these demands um, allows us to perhaps collectively organize, as in the case with a lot of re-municipalization uh, as that happened in Berlin, for example, um, thinking about why energy is produced and used. Um, and hope, I hope my discussion allowed to shift um, the starting points a little bit by incorporated, incorporating certain networks that might not usually be incorporated. Um, so I hope, yeah, this was useful to at least some of you to think about energy resource use and what the potentials of large scale action might be. Yeah, I look forward to your, your questions. Thank you so much. It was just in time, perfectly, super intense and so many uh, like streams and topics inside, very inspiring. Uh, right now in Poland, I'm talking guys and you can prepare your questions. Uh, use this time because I have my own questions to you as well. Uh, right, uh, right now in Poland, we we have uh, the discussion of the role of uh, regular citizens who can uh, take part in energy production. So it's one of the like the most vivid, uh, uh, vivid topic here uh, in CE because of course right now we have very centralized uh, uh, market of energy and it's not relevant anymore. I have like a more research question for you. Could you just give us more details on this uh, Indian village case? Which, uh, because as I understand, you led the uh, in-depth uh, research there, uh, ethnographic one. So if you could just tell us the short story of this community and what happened uh, uh, next after your research, if you have the follow-up information on them. Uh yeah, well, first of all, clarification. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry. Um, I actually, I was not the one to lead ethnographic research in this village. I'm relying on a lot of people um, working on the Indian electrification mm -hmm. space. I would be happy to link um, their names um, either to the chat Super. or mm -hmm. um, an email. So I'm predominantly relying on the ethnographic work. But this is, this is a very new project. It only started in 2016. Um, and it it's in a it's in a small village in the west of India, where um, together with a Sri Lankan um, nonprofit research institute, a group of farmers were encouraged to use solar energy to irrigate um, instead of um, relying on the state provided energy. And in fact, when they started collecting and when they started producing enough energy. Um, they started producing surplus um, so that they could sell mm -hmm. it back to the local power grid. Um, so it it's a real yeah it's a really um, interesting case about how um, and it's not a lot it's it's about nine or ten farmers so far who who managed this and who have managed to get the technical expertise in the last couple of years to actually successfully produce more than necessary for the electrification of the village and also for the surplus. But uh, sorry, who introduced this idea to this community? It wasn't the state, so that was the, the company, the business state? 
Um, it, it's the, um, it's the International Water Management Institute based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. um, which have, um, which have a lot of research groups focused on trying to figure out, um, different local solutions. So, 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 but that's what I was trying to get at, which is the local nature of a lot of these, mm -hmm. of a lot of these things, which is not to say that there weren't um material developments but i think it's interesting in what way we think of these material developments because of course the entire village was electrified however um they still operate in the same yet they produce a bit more surplus and they have a bit more money so i think um and this is where i was encouraging that we expand the definition of energy also into the economic sphere um, and what sort of possibilities that might allow. But yeah, not, not my ethnographic work. No worries, that was super interesting. Thank you for giving us details on that. Uh, I have another question, but if any one of you would love to ask uh, the question, don't hesitate, like put it on the chat or just uh, uh, open your camera and and you can be part of this discussion. I was thinking because that was super interesting the um, the topic of the role of the state uh, when we were talking about the building the scale. Uh, if you could like give me like a more your own thoughts about what is the best balance between having state inside the system and not having and how it could help in preventing all those risks you are listing to us when we are talking about scaling up uh, uh, this, uh, this solutions. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, I think my uh, conception would be the sort of spaces that are collectively organized that actually make demands from the state for the time being for increased public goods and increased um, sort of equitable options of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in, I think in my research also theoretically, um, I would say that I'm not, I'm not that far yet to sort of rethink what, what the larger transformation would be, let's say of, of a national power grid. Um, mm -hmm. However, I think I do, um, I do visualize direct spaces where and this is the example i think um i give or i i have been reading about the developments in berlin um about wanting to democratically manage um the city's electricity grid so i think there are certain um as citizens certain demands that can be placed that are much more immediate that are much more um, despite being large scale, they're, that are much more immediate. And I think that's where I, I think the role of the state here is still very traditional. We're not radically transforming it yet, but mm -hmm. I think theoretically, um, this is how far I've worked it out. And I would, yeah, I think the next step would be to think about, well, what are the larger um, transformations that require to change um, from the state to, I guess, how it how it uh, legalizes a private property regime um, relevant to energy. So, what are your, what are your plans for next step of your research? Where 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 you want to follow? What directions? Um, well, I think immediately um, working working on my master's thesis, um, I'm directly exploring the consequences of extraction. So, in this discussion, I spoke. Um, about about that. Um, so that is an area where I'm look where I'm looking to increase both. Um, well, I think the times don't don't allow it. Um, I would have hoped for ethnographic work, but I guess our times might not allow that. Um, but for more in depth work on certain extraction sites in the world, um, and what sort of impacts and what sort of um, labor regimes they utilize. Um, and how are how are they determined by the materials extracted? So that's that's the immediate future. But I guess um, the larger future would definitely be in direction of the state. 
super. Thank you so much. Do we have any other people who wants to ask? Uh, Saki, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Correct me, please. I want to learn. Um, it's Shachi. Shachi. Okay, so if you want guys to ask Shachi a, a question, that is the place for you. I can ask more of my own question. Uh, because at the beginning, you told us that um, you're trying uh, to treat, that, that it's super important how we are treating commons. And uh, you start with treating commons not as a good, <laughs> but as a relation. And what are the consequences, in, especially in the research methodology, when you have in the center uh, commons as a relation? Uh, what, what, what are the consequences of building the methodology of, of you know, mm, tracking or monitoring that? Um, well, I think for me, the first would be the recognition that um, since it's a relation, it, it, it has to be always renegotiated um, and understood through change, um, which requires us to constantly go back and see um, if we're using very if we're using particular case studies, not to take it as a static relationship between an, an asset, a space or, or, or a thing and, and the people that live on it, but rather how, is, how does it go through different uses for the people um, who want to use it? How does it go through the, how does it even change conceptually um, for the people who want to use it in the future? And I think, um, well, and in terms of the impact it would have on research, um, I think it allows for a larger um, or a more broader conceptualization of what governance might be um, and not just treating it as an object that one has to, um, one, one simply holds in, holds in common, I guess, but rather that, and this is not, this is not going into the, uh, the post-humanist sort of tradition and trying to say that, oh, it has its own agency. That, that's, not, that's not where I'm going, but more generally to, to constantly renegotiate what kind of politics are possible um, with relation to, to a changing thing as opposed to just an entity. I think because, that's- Because building on that, when, uh, when you speak about this idea, it's totally exciting. And of course, everyone in our place should agree that it should be like this, but to negotiate, especially constantly, uh, all the stakeholders in this movement have to be equipped or to really be part of this discussion. And normally when we have this hierarchical system, negotiation is impossible because uh, one stakeholder is, in, is imposing something on others. So do you have, and sorry, if you don't have quick answer, do you have an example that actually this negotiations was in place and what was the conditions uh, that they enable those people to be in a, such a movement uh, positions to each other? I think I would need I would need a little bit of time to think about it. Um, I don't. Well, I think off off the top of my head, having read recently, um, there's a collective, um, and I think this would be in a very traditional sense for the protection of a particular particular environment. Um, there's a collective which tries tries to locate the forest areas in the Himalayas. Um, as sites that should be protected, mm -hmm. not necessarily as reservations, not necessarily as um, places of national heritage and all those cultural connotations, but simply that they shouldn't be raised down. Um, and it's a very mm -hmm. reactionary sort of politics. And I think in some other contexts, um, the same place has been, um, it has been tried to go under the National Heritage Act, et cetera. And then eventually that changed to simply being a reactionary movement that no, nothing can be on this. Um, so I think that's the one quick thing that comes to my head, but I'd have to think more. Like definitely you are bringing so many interesting examples from the whole world that it would be nice to track your work to, to really learn something more about examples. So thank you for that. Uh, when I was uh, reading your uh, abstract, there was one sentence which was super interesting for me. When uh, I will be not, I won't be qu quoting you. The, 
uh, I just remember that um, you were telling us it's not so simple that if you start doing something in cooperatives uh, or using commons in the center, it doesn't mean that it's something good for nature. Uh, and this oversimplification is super risky. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, the context I know in CE that very, very often we think that when it's something decentralized or when we're talking about commons, but naturally it is good for nature. So if you could give us some more examples when it doesn't work, uh, like when you were talking about the solar panel, which are to long ter long in long term perspective, they are not very good for nature. But right now we think that they are the best what we can have. So could you give us, if you have in your mind, any other examples when this oversimplification that talking on commons is naturally something good for the ecosystem uh, to make us aware and not to make any shortcuts in thinking? Well, well, I mean, as of now, um, in terms of other examples, I, I think I am still centered around, um, I guess, different types of renewable energy sources that require um, batteries um, that need to be used, that need uh, to store the energy produced, um, and where these batteries come from, how they're made, and um, what, what are the sort of um, just what is the ecological baggage that is being put on different parts of the world um, by our demands um, to make certain storable um, energy. Um, so I think, yeah, so uh, yeah, I know I already uh, spoke about solar panels, but I think um, for me, the, the most direct example um, of this does come in the discussions of um, simply having simply the linear transition between things that are not uh, well things that are oil and then things that are not oil things that are fossil fuels and then things that are not fossil fuels um, and I think this sense of uh, decentralization I think is really uh, crucial there um, because it it assumes that certain things like you know large-scale things like transport or um, which are huge concerns for us which are huge concerns of how we should um, re rethink not just I would say not just the materiality of transport. Um, and I mean, just to give you an example, I, uh, I was thinking about this recently, which is that um, um, an electric car or any sort of a car that uses a, ba a battery operated vehicle in general, um, holding about five to six people would, would use about four to five kilograms of lithium um, would, um, versus a Tesla, which uses about seven to eight kilograms. Um, our phone, as a comparison, is about seven grams, um, like eight grams. So that's that's the amount. But if we if we want to scale this to questions of transport, for example, we quickly see the kind of extractive um, like pressure it puts on different environments. Um, so I would I would say that this allows us to think more about the moral regimes um, that are also in place, but what is acceptable and what is not. I mean. Um, things like private transport. Uh, I, I think these are these are the areas or examples I would give for why um, I think decentralization sometimes limits the discussion. Super, we are overusing your kindness to be our star guest here. Uh, and I have two questions uh, in a chat. Uh, Mike, do you want to ask this question to, or I have to do it in stand of view? If you're not reacting, I'm taking your floor. So the question from Mike is, what do commons have in common? That sounds like a poetry, Mike. Uh, maybe something more substantial material than the idea of the common good. Uh, no, definitely. I think here I would um, go to the more historical instances of corporate Activism and commoning. Um, in my presentation, I took the liberty, or in my discussion today and my research, I'm taking the liberty of using commoning. Um, honestly, you're you're right, Mike. I'm using it to sort of signify um, the common good, but also just general general connotations like democratic governance, mutual aid, etc. Um, um, and this is not something I'm because this is not. Um, a thing of historical research, I have not, I think, 
delimited the notion of commons so much, um, but perhaps that's that would be another future avenue for me to think about what commons actually have in common. I hope that was a satisfactory answer. So I will merge my question and Bartomi question into one, okay? <laughs> Uh, if anyone wants to ask uh, more questions, don't hesitate. We have space and time. Um, but I know, Satya, that you are tired, so I won't overuse your time. Uh, you've already mentioned a little bit about that, but I was thinking about the, the big changes who can appear in the, in the future, which can totally like change the landscape of this topic you are covering. For example, this huge... Uh, Jakiś magazyn, someone from Poland has to storage. Like if we will have like a, a tech, um, uh, innovation or techniques, technology to really storage the surplus energy that could be easily taken over by corporations and all what we are talking here about will be not valid anymore. So did you take this uh, into consideration? And what do you think about that? That is really like in the future you see this. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, I think the first problem that um, one might run into is about the stores of energy, as I as I spoke about a little bit, that if there are large enough surpluses, um, where does it all go? And, and what is the potentiality of storing it? Um, but I guess this is where, um, and I, I have to admit, I'm not, um, I'm not sufficiently um, I think equipped to answer this question yet. Um, but this is where I would say that our discussions, especially things of like this conference and also of, of commoning really allow us to rethink what sort of rethink property rights, rethink mm -hmm. the sort of legal claims to ownership that might not allow for such kind of um, things to take place okay. in the future. Mm -hmm. Because that's uh, that's really the place where the contestation is happening um, in the space of ownership in the space of legality. So I think, um, yeah, I think this is this would be the area where one would have mm -hmm. to really think about how it's actively contested and um, to what extent. I mean, of course, there are power imbalances um, in in this, but I think um, we would really have to re if. If in a, in the scenario in the future we do um, there are ways of producing this and storing it, um, we would um, I think would have to find ways of what away from our our conception of ownership. Um, I would say super, and I think that is also like like the legal perspective is super crucial, and that could be some kind of role for the state. Of course, the uh, we can say wisdom state, not every state, but I see the role in uh, in testing uh, uh, legal solution, which can make the place for this better and decentralized uh, future for uh, managing the energy. Um, guys, I was super, super fulfilled with information and cases you brought to us. That was super interesting, really. And I, I put my finger crossed to your uh, further career and I hope that you will achieve what your plan in the next uh, years. And I hope that coronavirus won't really ruin your plans to have ethnography in, uh, in other countries. So thank you so much, really.